Hello, I'm Julie Swenson, Managing Director of Forward Theatre Company in Madison, Wisconsin. And I'm Mike Fisher, Milwaukee-based theatre writer and dramaturg. I'm Jen Alpoff Gray, Founder and Artistic Director of Forward Theatre Company, and this is Theatre Forward, a twice-monthly conversation about theatre from a local, regional, and national perspective. From Madison to Manhattan, we're excited to share insight into our own company while exploring issues surrounding theatre in the Midwest and around the country. Welcome to episode 42 of Theater Forward. All right, 42. Hello. <laughs> this week's conversation is about the ones that got away. Plays and musicals, Mike, that we have read <laughs> and loved over the years and that for a whole host of reasons we wound up not producing. We'll talk about some of our favorites and the factors that kept them off our theater stages. Should be an interesting glimpse into the myriad considerations that go into planning a season. And I've been looking back at the plays we've considered during Forward's 12 seasons. Julie, I imagine you've also been thinking about your years running Renaissance Theater Works in Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. And Mike, now that you're a part of Forward's advisory company, you have a voice in play selection decisions too. So we will all have some favorites to discuss. Uh, so I'm looking forward to this. Uh, Julie, do you wanna kick us off with, uh, with one of your plays that got away? Well, there have been some disappointments, but here's one that sticks in my head after years and years. Um, Milwaukee Shakespeare Company uh, was founded by two college students at Lawrence University, um, Chris Abley and John McClay. And they were young, a uh, young company. We were gonna do a collaboration with them of Helen Edmondson's The Clearing. Uh, applied for rights, talked to John McClay. We were getting casting together. We were deciding the director. We were figuring out how to split the box office, split expenses. It was moving along. And then we found out that one of the companies in Milwaukee had gotten the rights just to hold on to in case they want to do this play. And I reached out to this theater company and said, are you really going to do it? Because we are, we're moving full steam ahead. We really want to do this. I think it would have made a difference in each of our companies, the Milwaukee Shakespeare and Renaissance Theater Works, if we had done this collaboration. And that theater company said, nah, we, we're going to hold on to it. And you know what? They have never done Helen Edmondson's The Clearing. And that wrinkles me to this day. Well, that is a very specific reason to not do a play, not being able to get those rights. And a very is, specific story. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's that's a heartbreaker for sure. Well, I sh you know I should um, say that one of the the prompts for us in in deciding to talk about this particular topic is that right now here at Forward, we're in the middle of doing a series of basically Zoom readings over the course of this fall that we're doing just as a, as a sort of private thank you to, um, to our subscribers this season who, you know, as with many theaters across the country during this pandemic, um, the subscribers who said, yep, we'll still buy our tickets and we are along for the ride and whatever happens, we're there to support you. It, it's such a gift and it gives us, you know, such um, a foundation as we as we deal with all of the, the COVID challenges. And so we, we wanted to do something extra for them and putting together some Zoom readings was a, was a pretty easy uh, project for this fall. And so we chose as a theme for the readings that we picked, the plays, you know, some of our favorite plays that we wound up not producing for whatever reason. This was a great excuse um, to do those. And, you know, a couple of the plays that we're going to be doing in this reading series, for me, have been at the absolute top of my heartbreak list. Um, and I feel like I should, I should start with my number one the number one heartbreaker for me in the entirety of my time with Forward is Christopher Diaz's The Elaborate Entrance of Chad Deity, <laughs> which um, we read back in 2014. Dear Lord, we fell so hard in love with this play. Uh, I was obsessed with it. Our entire advisory company was obsessed with it. We wanted to do it so badly. And the technical and expense challenges of doing this seemed so insurmountable. We spent about a year trying to figure out a way that we could still justify the cost of doing this play. And we couldn't 
we just couldn't ever quite make it work. And so we were doing a reading of it um, next month. I cannot wait. Um, and, you know, for that play, for those who don't know anything about it, it's uh, set in the world of professional wrestling. And all, all, four of the five characters are wrestlers. And there is actual wrestling you know, theatrical WWE style wrestling, but there's wrestling in the play. So you need to ca cast people who are physically able to do that kind of work. You need to spend, I mean, I think for safety reasons, as well as aesthetic ones, probably a couple extra weeks of rehearsal beyond your normal rehearsal period to choreograph all of that and um, make it look believable and wonderful. Um, it's also, and this is one of the reasons we loved it, it's a very, very diverse cast, but being here in Madison, Wisconsin, um, that provided a, a, an extra layer of challenge in finding the actors that could do it. So, um, so there were just, there were so many reasons, financial and logistical, that we never produced that play. But at any point since 2014, if you were to ask me, what's the play I'm saddest that we have not produced, that's the one. So that's well, number one on my list. I think everybody on this call from uh, offline conversations is going to know what my number one uh, pick is of the plays that Forward considered and didn't do. Now, I've only been on the advisory company for two years, but I have the immense benefit of our associate artistic director, Karen Miller, who has chronicled from the beginning of Forward's history, every single discussion every single pause in breath, it feels like, that has been taken in the debates over every single one of the plays that we have considered. Uh, and it is, you know, someday when the history of this amazing company, which is going to shake the ground of American theater people, is written, that this is going to be an incredibly valuable uh, archive. And so I went back and looked in at the discussions for a drum roll, please, a Gloria, Brandon Jacob Jenkins play, which I consider <laughs> maybe the most important and best play that's been written in the 21st century. Um, it's it, it, there's a couple of plays of his that we've read for different reasons. Forward hasn't been able to, to to do any of them. They're monsters to do. I mean, in terms of the technical challenges involved, a lot of them deal with very difficult theoretical meta issues. But Gloria, the reasons we ended up not being able to do it uh, are a lot simpler. Uh, there is at the end of Act One, uh, sort of a, a going postal moment in the. Uh, editor's room, newspaper editor's room, where act one unfolds, and you have blood spattered all over the place. Um, and that was difficult even when the play was written in terms of productions. There are other theater companies around the country that really wanted to do this play and decided not to. And I respect the reasons why uh, people are gun shy, no pun intended, about about doing it, but the issues that it raises in terms of the cult of motherhood, the culture of narcissism, the cult of personality in America, the way we uh, fetishize and, and, and glorify violence, uh, the way in which we have gotten further and further away from hard news content and moved closer to fake news. I mean, it is such a huge canvas uh, that he covers and very, very compelling dialogue. It's a beautiful play. I think a lot of people in, at Forward felt it was a beautiful play. Play, but they were, for reasons I understand, even though I disagree with, nervous about doing it because of the gun violence uh, within it. And I know we've talked about that a little bit before, but I wanted to give a greater shout out here to the actual substance of the play itself, because it is so much more uh, than that particular moment. That's the one that got away from me. Yeah. And anyone who listened to our um, podcast episode last year sometime about gun violence on stage knows that I am with you. I am deeply, deeply, deeply enamored of that play. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's tough to show unexpected gun violence on stage these days, because you honestly, I, you know, you put yourself in the, in the seat of the audience member who may have that moment of not knowing if it's part of the play or if it's an actual threat to their own safety. And it is, um, so deeply upsetting that that's the world we're in, that you have to assume that that's the calculus happening in the audience member's brain because you can't you can't warn them all it's coming or the play doesn't work. Right. And if you don't warn them it's coming, I think it's it becomes too too terrifying. But I'm with you. That is, uh, we would have liked to have done a reading of that one in our series. We couldn't get the rights for it, unfortunately. But that uh, that was right up there as well. 
Julie, what's another one for you? I have I have a genre of, of uh, shows, and and it is the state that we live in that is predominantly white that prevents us from doing some plays. And um, I am surprised in Wisconsin we have a lot of Native American tribes in this state. There are a lot of really great plays written by Native Americans. And we don't have the actors here. And, and I think that that um, precludes us, especially as a company that is Wisconsin-based and wants to support people living here, it takes some plays off of the table. And um, I don't know how to rectify that. I mean, we will rectify that. We will have to go out and um, to other to other places in the country if we want to do some of these plays. But it's um, I've I've read a bunch that I think are really beautiful that just can't be done because we don't have the actors in this. Yeah, yeah. That, that those casting challenges are such a mm-hmm. balance. You know, when you when you started that. Um, discussion of those plays, uh, it immediately made me think of, of another play um, or, or a couple of plays that for, not for casting reasons, but for audience makeup reasons, um, are also difficult given um, given the racial demographics of our community. Um, and, and, you know, we obviously are doing a, a lot to try to further diversify our audience, but there are our community is 86% white. It's, it's, it's a challenge. Um, and so if you read a play like, um, what to send up when it goes down or oh, fair yeah. view by Jackie Sibley's jury. I mean, right. those are two incredibly powerful plays, unbelievably powerful plays. I would love for someone nearby to do them. I mean, maybe in Milwaukee where there is, um, a, a different demographic, but here in Madison, Honestly, at the at least right now, right now, no matter what we did, our audience would be not entirely but vastly white. And I don't know that those plays are really done justice in front of a predominantly white audience. And and like you said, that it, it's a hard it's a hard thing to solve. It's a hard thing to know what to do. Like. You know, it, even if we we can bring in all of the artists of color that we need to tell those stories appropriately, if the audience reflects the community we're in and is mostly white, I feel like it does a disservice to plays like that. So th- those are some on my right. regret list. I have a bunch that are, you know, this is uh, a less creative and, and a surprising category of, of things we couldn't do that we considered, but it's just plays based on size. Um, and the one that, especially after watching what CNN rightly called the shit show the other night of a debate, um, I, I think the one that stands out tops for me is Oslo. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful play about the uh, Israeli-Palestinian peace accord back in the early 90s at a moment when it looked like we might actually get somewhere. Uh, an agreement largely negotiated behind the scenes in Norway with the help of Norwegian diplomats. It's funny, it's poignant, it's got a cast of 15. Um, and so even though it speaks to a moment which seems hopelessly far removed right now from the United States, although, hey, if you wanna watch the New Zealand debate of the two people running for prime minister that unfolded like 12 hours after our debate, you actually can <laughs> still see civility um, on stage between political opponents. But this was people who had spent 30 years blowing each other up um, and they found a way to come together at the table and for that brief shining moment, move us forward. Um, and you know, especially in the context of the fake peace agreements that um, 45 has just negotiated, which mean absolutely nothing except to help his reelection chances, to see a real peace agreement in the most intractable issue, arguably in the world, um, and, 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 and have us almost get to yes, is both heartbreaking um, in terms of the history that's unfolded since, but also a shining example of what both theater and politics can make happen when people show a little bit of, of imagination. So I really wish we could do that play. I saw it in Chicago. It was a joint production even there. It's just a big sandwich um, for any company in Wisconsin um, to do. I mean, Milwaukee Rep's probably the only one that could even think about trying to put on a play that, that size. 
has the stage to put on, on a play that size. Sure, that's I mean, right. really, there's there's also room room in the theater. Yeah. 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 You know, cast size um, makes me think of, of uh, another play that we have talked about um, in a different context on this podcast before. Um, but it's certainly on my list of ones I would have loved to have done, which was The Wolves, oh, um, yeah. which is uh, partly a cast size issue in why we didn't do it. But as we discussed uh in a prior conversation also um, because it is a cast with one exception entirely of um, high school aged characters. And um, for us as a professional company here in uh, Madison uh, without, you know, let's say some really robust grad school programs nearby to come up with enough professional level ready actors who also look young enough to really believably play high school students so that the caliber of the production meets expectations for our company. Um, but it's also, these characters are believable. It's just, it, it was, it was just such a huge um, mismatch. I think that script with, um, with what we could achieve here at forward, but my goodness, it's such a gorgeous play. And, I was so excited it was finally at least going to happen in Madison because the University Theater, which is a really ideal um, venue Every for a show like this, be doing it. yeah. Every so year. they had programmed it, and and it was one of the casualties to COVID this spring. I really hope they come back to it when we're able to be back in person. It reminds me of another. I, I mean, I, this is this is a sort of plug to or a, a, a plea to Madison, UW Madison, to think about. Uh, this play as well. Another play that Forward looked at that we decided partly for that same reason we couldn't do is Brandon Jacob Jenkins, Jenkins to come to him again, his play Girls, uh, which also requires a number of younger uh, actors. Uh, and it's also a big cast size, but it is such a wonderful send up of the Bacchae. Uh, and just really asking, again, hard questions, but in a very um, almost manically funny uh, 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 way. So, Well, while we're on the topic of, of, pro of plays that we think that college programs should do, let's just make this, <laughs> up this discussion like, hey, colleges, college. here's what we want you to do. Um, uh, you know, another play that I read, oh, maybe a year or two ago that ah, I want to see it so badly, but it really needs to be done on a campus is Colossal by Andrew Hinderaker, who's um, a local writer. Oh, and um, uh, he actually, he's getting um, more known. He uh, was the creator of this new Netflix show, Away, with Hilary Swank and Josh Charles. Um, but he's a playwright and Madison based and has recently moved back here. Um, <laughs> this play, it's it's got a dance troupe. Uh, it's about a football team. It's really about football and our obsession about football. Um, but it's it, it's from the point of view of both really loving passionately and embracing some of the beauty and and community that comes from football, while also not remotely um, diminishing all the things we know about football and, and the danger and the traumatic brain injuries and all of the um, brutality of it. it. It really embraces both. There's a marching band in the play. <laughs> um, I mean, it is, it's enormous. It's, it's multidimensional. Uh, again, I can't, I, there, I just don't think there's any scenario in which a company like Forward could do it, but it would be a brilliant way to bring different aspects of a college campus together. And I really I, hope somebody does. I actually sent it to a number of folks that I know who teach theater throughout the UW system around the state. I was like, read this play. You should do this play. There are, there are some, um, and this is a consideration too, not just subject matter, but the fact that we produce shows on a thrust stage, you know, audience three, three sides around limits in some ways what we can do and like a big huge marching band and football team becomes problematic or the girls with yeah. of people in yeah, a yeah. forest it's really <laughs> difficult to do on right. that stage and, and that has to be a consideration too one of the plays um i i, I'm, I feel like you're just teeing me up julie because one of the other ones on my list is a play that uh, I absolutely love and specifically took off the table for us because um, it is a play that is written for a proscenium house. And that is Stephen Karam's The Humans. Oh, yeah. Uh, which is written, it takes place in a two level apartment, 
a duplex apartment. And the way the play is written, you need to be aware of where all the characters are in this duplex apartment, you know, and the audience view in a thrust configuration theater is different throughout the house. And there's almost no logistical way to do that two story house where everybody from their different seats in the thrust theater can see the whole set both levels and see where all those characters are. Um, it is a play that's written for a proscenium. And so it was, uh, it was really enjoyable to see the only theater in Maryland um, currently is running a, a digital production directed by our friend, Aaron Posner, um, where, you know, it's, it's sort of a Zoom style show, uh, which we can do that. <laughs> and you can just move the, the actors faces around um, against uh, a picture of, of what that set would look like. But I, I you know, we, we did Karen's play, Sons of the Prophet. I, just love his writing. He is so human in his characters and the stories that he tells. And I think it's a brilliant, I think it's a brilliant play. I really, really do. Agreed. Um, but it's, but it is, it is that rare piece that was actually really specifically written for a proscenium house. And maybe there's a designer out there that can come in and, and show me how how we can really effectively do justice to that script in a, in a thrust stage, but haven't come up with it yet. Yeah. A, a, a proscenium house with a tall enough um, ceiling and grid to, to be able to do that second story. That's the biggest problem with that play. I mean, the biggest obstacle, I should say, because I think it's brilliant. I agree with you. Um, but that two story set and, and the desire for the entire audience to see multiple stories and and see what's going on on each on each of those flights um is is difficult for a lot of spaces i mean it's one of the reasons i think that we can't do uh, a, a play like samuel hunter's the greater clements um which requires this also requires a two-story set god it's Gorge, so beautiful it's such a gorgeous <laughs> i mean we're also doing another samuel hunter play i get it so but it's um uh, you know, that's one of the reasons why I, I, I play like that's probably one that we we, we, we can't do. Um, I have a whole category of plays that have to do with something that the uh, theater communications group of Hazard of Fortunes pointed out when it was talking about the future of the American play. This has to be a 10 year old book now. But it said, you know, you can get people in regional theater to come and see something that it hits as hard as you can possibly imagine politically, for example, um, that as long as it re retains a sort of naturalistic or realistic form can go way out there. And people, even if they're a little reluctant, will follow what you cannot get people to accept um, in theater generally, and particularly, frankly, outside of New York here, I, I even though for all the New York bashing, I, I occasionally do, I have to give New York its props here, is plays that are formally dramatically innovative. People just won't go see them. They, they, they don't want to, um, the, to go down that road. And it's one of the reasons I think that we don't see more plays in this country by Carol Churchill, who I've mentioned before, one of whose plays, Love and Information, is a play forward looked at a few years ago. It involves 57 playlets, which, and this is, if that's not daunting enough, they can be put together in multiple orders in terms of how they're presented on screen. But it is a brilliant dissection of the way in which we um, know things, are consuming knowledge to know everything and what that costs us. Um, the difference between information overload and you know reconstructed uh, history through memory and imagination and how maybe knowing less and therefore being able to imagine more is ultimately a good thing. The relation between all of that and privacy, I mean, it is just an amazing play, um, but it's a play that I think um, uh, most audiences and probably including ours would have would struggle with um, because it's just hard to figure out what's what's going on. And I understand that that's frustrating uh, for people, but gosh, I'm sorry we can't we can't do it. Mike, I have to tease you because the uh, the deprivations of the last six months have clearly really gotten into your system because you said they could be put in any order on screen. Oh my God! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Although, actually, you know, given the sorts of things she's talking about, that's awesome. It's sort of true, right? I mean, but yes, I, I I've watched way too much uh, Zoom, Zoom theater. 
<laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, I feel for you. <laughs> well, it's just another, that's just the further implosion of, of virtual reality and actual reality, which goes to another play I really, really love. And Julie, I think Renaissance was actually considering this when you were still there, but it's the play The Nether uh, by Jennifer oh, yeah. Kelly, um, which is a play that there it's both form and I think subject matter. It deals with pedophilia. Um, and so like a play like Bruce Norris's Downstate, another great play I wish we could do that deals with pedophilia. It's the subject matter is so disturbing for people. But what it's really about, in addition to that, is the is the implosion of distinctions between what is real and what we imagine because of what's going on with screens. So it's just why that was my segue, Jen. Right, right, right. So, but, you know, the, the whole idea of what we imagine or fantasize. Um, and what screens now make possible in terms of being able to construct those fantasies and how that, the moral implications for that of how we live in the actual world. In, in the play, you can live out these fantasies with, uh, with children um, that are not real. They're, they're just constructed virtually, which is still, in the way the play is presented, incredibly disturbing and upsetting. But the question is, where is the line between that and reality? And how much of that do you police and why? I think it's a tough, tough play in terms of the moral issues that it raises. And it makes me squirm just talking about it, to be honest. <laughs> we actually did a reading in somebody's um, living room with a bunch of our um, uh, donors who, who happen to be people uh, a little bit older who were like, let's do it. Let's do it. And I was, I was amazed by that. Yeah, it's a yeah. it's a disturbing, um, but really thoughtful play. I you know I feel like as we start to probably wind this conversation down, I'd be remiss if I didn't um, mention a play that I read uh, that we read and discussed. Maybe again, maybe a year and a half, two years ago. Um, a time is blurred so much of late um, that I loved this play but it's almost comical how it checks just about every box of things that would stop me from putting a play on stage. And that is a play called The Year to Come by Lindsay Ferentino. And I will just r rattle off a few of the things that this really wonderful, wonderful, beautiful, thought-provoking and funny play contains. Uh, first of all, very large cast. Uh, the play is for the for all but i think one scene <laughs> but then there's a different location for the, for one scene but for the entirety of the rest of the play it is centered around a backyard pool in florida and the script is written in such a way that you can't just kind of have the you know the lip of the pool and no one that no you actually have to be able to get the people into the pool the dialogue necessitates that the cast be able to get fully into the swimming pool so that's, you know, that's challenging right there. Uh, let's see what else is in this play. Uh, there's some nakedness, there's nudity, which in and of itself is not an absolute, you know, line in the sand. But, you know, you have to think long and hard before you do that, especially in a thrust theater. Um, a character's vomit on stage. That's another one I just personally don't love. Again, I would do a play with that, but it's not a... <laughs> something I take lightly. Um, there are scenes where uh, dead animal carcasses have to drop from the sky and land right. in the pool. Right. Um, I think it snows on stage too, if I'm not mistaken, yes, in one does. of the scenes. So I, it just, it was funny. I remember reading that play and simultaneously going, my God, I love this story. This writing is so good. These characters are so right. good. And every other page, I felt like I exclaimed out loud, are you kidding me? <laughs> it was almost like she was trying to make an unproducible play, uh, which made me really sad because I loved it. You know, so someone should make a movie out of it, I guess. Right. Yeah. It would be a perfect, because the story is really brilliant. And um, and if there is a theater company that can figure out all of those things, I'll go to it. Yeah, I mean, I'll buy a ticket. <laughs> it would be amazing to pull that off. But, <laughs> right. It was, so. a, it was it's, it's something, that one. Um, 
we've been going for a little while here. I think this might be a good time to uh, to wrap up this episode of Theater Forward. Although I suspect we could keep going and we may need to come back later another time for another We need round. to do a whole session just on musicals. I know, Mike, I said musicals and we never even got to one. All right. Yes. I've have- got a list. I've got a list. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a date. Um, but that will be it for this episode of Theater Forward, a conversation about theater in Wisconsin, the Midwest, and America. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Jen Uphoff Gray. I'm Julie Swenson. And I'm Mike Fisher. Our podcast is produced by Scott Hayden, who, if you tune into the reading of Chad Deity, you will see with his action figures um, <laughs> as, as, as part of the show. I mean, how can you miss that? Anyway, you can follow us or share your thoughts on Facebook, uh, Twitter, or Instagram at Theater Forward, as always, with an ER. And if you enjoy this podcast, don't forget to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you might tune in and be sure to leave a review. We're so grateful to have you listening and we will be back soon for another Theater Forward Conversation.